Hi, we're the Blow Pops group, and we'll be talking about the building blocks of language. Hello, my name is Evelyn Garcia, and today I will be explaining the study. So to begin with, according to George Ewell in the study of language, syntax is described as one of the five major building blocks of language. Syntax is the structure and ordering of components within a language. The word itself comes from the Greek word syntaxis, which means the arrangement. Now that all may seem a bit confusing, so in more simpler terms, syntax is how we arrange and put sentences together so it flows evenly. Some of the rules of syntax. So because syntax is so broad, the following are just a few rules that we were introduced to in the class and in the study of language. So today I'll be talking about deep structure, surface structure, the use of tree, tree diagrams, and the symbols used in syntactic analysis. The surface structure was proposed by Noam Chomsky, and he proposed that there were two different types of structures, surface structure and deep structure. So surface structure can be defined as the superficial structure of a wall-formed sentence. It doesn't have to include any abstract or underlying um, representation, but it, it is also described as the active sentence. So an example is Eve drove the car. Since Eve drove the car is only fo focusing on the action, it's considered the surface structure. So next will be deep structure. Deep structure is the abstract level of structural organization in which all the elements determining structural interpretation are represented. So usually these sentences are represented as a noun phrase plus a verb and another noun phrase. So with deep structure, you must have to change the surface structure without losing the underlying meaning of the sentence. So with the car was driven by Eve and Eve was driving the car, they still have the same deep structure, but they have different surface structure. So this is a syntax tree diagram. It's a visual representation of syntactical structures used in a sentence. These are really good for children who are finding it very difficult to put sentences together and locating noun phrases, verb phrases, adjectives, articles, and other syntactical um, categories. So when we use syntactic analysis, there are symbols that represent some of these syntax phrases. So S would be for sentence, and P would be used for a noun phrase, ADV for adverb, PP for prepositional phrase, and R for article. So these are just a few of the ones that were introduced in the book. But when you are working with a child as an SLP, it's important to introduce these symbols before the syntax tree diagram so they know what to use when they are putting apart the sentence and the diagrams. Hi, my name is Danielle Sanchez and I'm going to be talking about morphology. So what is morphology, you might ask? Well, the literal meaning of the word is the study of word forms. And what this means is that morphology is a branch of linguistics that focuses more on words and how words can be broken down into meaningful parts or even built from these meaningful parts. Now, when I say me meaningful parts, I'm referring to something called morphemes. And these are the minimal units of meaning or grammatical function that can be found in a word or even by themselves. And these morphemes happen to be divided into two different categories. The first category that we'll look at are free morphemes. And these are the types of morphemes that are the smallest units of meaning while also being complete words by themselves. So they can completely stand alone and be grammatically okay. But wait, there's more. Free morphemes can also be divided into categories known as lexical and functional morphemes. Lexical morphemes carry content and are made up of nouns, adjectives, verbs, and adverbs, while functional morphemes are made up of conjunctions, prepositions, articles, and pronouns. So some examples of lexical morphemes are words like girl, jump, yellow, ball, and house, while some examples of functional morphemes are and, above, the, her, and it. The next type of morphemes we'll look at are bound morphemes, which, judging by the name, must be bound to other morphemes. They simply cannot stand alone. So like free morphemes, bound morphemes can also be divided into two subcategories known as derivational and inflectional morphemes. 
Now, derivational morphemes are both prefixes and suffixes, and they can create a new word or change the grammatical category of the stem word. So, an example of creating a new word would be having the prefix un and adding it to happy, which creates a new word, unhappy, meaning not happy. So, some examples of other prefixes other than un are pre, ex, miss, and co. And some suffixes that are derivational morphemes are ly, full, ness, meant, etc. So the next type of bound morpheme is inflectional morphemes, and these are all suffixes, and they indicate aspects of the grammatical function of a word. But in simpler terms, they basically show word tense, possession, comparison, or whether or not a word is singular or plural. Now, there are eight types of inflectional morphemes in the English language. So we have apostrophe s, which indicates possession, or just s, which can show if a word is plural or not, and then it also can show if a word is present tense. Then we also have ing, which is present participle, ed, which indicates past tense, en, which is past participle, and er, which is comparative, as well as est, which is also superlative. Here we're going to see how phonetics and morphology intertwine to create morphs and allomorphs. Morphs are nothing more than the way that a morpheme sounds when it is spoken aloud. Allomorphs are morphs which carry the same morpheme meaning, but sound differently when applied to certain words. For example, the morpheme for plural is s. However, that morpheme or morph looks and or sounds different for the words cows, which creates a z sound, cats, which is just the regular s sound, couches, which is es, and fish, which completely excludes the s. English is a living language. We are constantly adding new words to the dictionary each year. This is why studying morphology is so practical. We not only use words every day, but we invent them too. Words are invented by borrowing from other languages, compounding or combining two words, clipping words by reducing a word with more than one syllable, conversion, which changes the grammatical function of a word, coinage, which is the invention of a brand new word, and derivation, which uses affixes and suffixes to make a new word. Derivation is the most common way that new words are invented. So semantics is going to be my topic for you guys today. Um, starting from basics, the definition of semantics is the study of the meaning of words, phrases, and sentences. Moving on from the definition, there are two types of meaning. One is conceptual and one is associative. Conceptual meaning is the descriptive meaning of the word, typically what is in a dictionary. So it brings an image to your mind. Um, the example that I have here is a beach is a place on the coast, typically sandy or rocky. That's typically what comes to our mind when we think of a beach. Um, the example in our book also referenced that a needle is a thin, sharp instrument um, that gives you a true definition and it brings an image to your mind. However, on the other hand, associative meaning is different connotations or associations of the word. So going on with the example of beach, some people think of the beach and they think that they'll get sunburned. Um, going on from the needle explanation from our book, it also said that some associative meanings that could go with needle were um, painful, you could think of drugs, you could think of if somebody in your family is diabetic, you might instantly think of their shots, something along those lines. It isn't the actual, like if someone says that something is sharp, the first thing that comes to mind might not necessarily be a needle, but a knife. So that isn't necessarily the definition of it, but it is something that we associate with the word. Also, having a good grasp on conceptual meaning and associate versus associative meaning 
um, helps us to avoid semantic oddness. Um, syntactically, sentences can be well formed as far as noun phrases, verb phrases, prepositional phrases, all of the things that we've learned in the previous section, but semantically they could still be odd. So you can say something along the lines of the sandwich ate the boy, even though syntactically it's correct, it just sounds odd. You know that a sandwich cannot eat the boy. It'd have to be vice versa and the boy would have to eat the sandwich. Continuing on with semantic rules, we also have instruments within certain sentences, which would be a tool or another object used to perform the action. So, for example, you could use the sentence, after the hurricanes, all you heard were chainsaws cutting down the trees. A chainsaw would be your instrument. Next, we have location, which is pretty obvious and self-explanatory. It's going to be where the object, the person, the entity is where they're located, that girl is standing under the tree. There is her location. Next, we have the source, which is where if you have action occurring with movement in a sentence, it's going to be where the object or the person moves from, otherwise known as a starting point. And then you have, on the other hand of that, is the goal, which is going to be the destination of the object or person, which is going to be their ending point. So they can start by their car and end walking into their house. So Sally had to go back out to her car to get her laptop before going in the house for the night. Moving on from semantic roles, we're now going to talk about lexical relations. There are many, many different categories within this, so please bear with me. Um, the first topic here is going to be synonymy, which is two or more words that are closely related but not necessarily exact. So words that can go together like vehicle, car, large, big, small, tiny, and so on and so forth. Um, then you have on the other end of the spectrum is antonymy, which are two words with pretty much opposite meanings. So large versus small, hot versus cold, snowing versus sunny. And over here to our right, we also have, I thought it was a cute little comic strip, the seven deadly synonyms, fatal, lethal, mort mortal, deathly, and so on. All of those words hold the same meaning ultimately, but they aren't exactly the same. Another subcategory of lexical relations is hyponymy, which is many categories within one umbrella term. So an animal can be broken down into multiple different categories, such as cat, dog, and bird. And then those can be broken even further down into, so if you take dog as an example, into husky, lab, boxer, and so on. You talk about cats, you can have a Persian, a Siamese, and the list goes on and on. Um, it's pretty much, like I said in the beginning, it's an umbrella term. Um, prototypes are typical thing. It's when you say a word, it's going to be the typical thing that comes like first to mind. So um, when you say bird, the first thing you would think of is probably like a rogue, uh, a crow, a robin, or a pigeon, something along those lines. Not necessarily a duck or a penguin, because some of those can be questionable. Some people might not agree that a bird is actually, or a penguin actually falls under the bird category, but in fact it does. So it's going to be without questionable doubt an example of the word. It's kind of like an association. Next we have homophones, which are two different written forms of a word that are phonetically produced the same way. So everyone knows our two, two, and two. Um, two as in T-O-O -O, means also and 2-T-W-O would be numeric, and then 2-T-O can be used in almost any other instance. Um, the other thing that we can think of with this is the there, there, and there. They are, 
there with possession and there is a location. They're all spelled completely differently, but as we pronounce them, you wouldn't have any clue the difference of them unless you're looking at the surrounding content. Um, then you have homonyms, which are when one form of a word has two different meanings. So here I put down record versus record. The first one is going to be an action to record a album, while the other one is going to be a physical noun, a record. You can go to the record store and buy. Next we have polysyny, which is when a word can be used with differential meaning. So take the word date, for example. There are so many different things you can think of when you hear the word date. It can be the fruit, a date on a calendar, a lunch date with the girls, a blind date. Any, uh, any of those can be used with that word. However, there's so many different meanings that go with it. Um, then you have metonymy, which are words with a connection. So if someone says there's, if you get a brief interruption on your TV set because there's going to be a message from the White House, you automatically know in your in the back of your mind that it's going to be a, pre a presidential speech or some kind of a message from our president, not necessarily the White House. We all know that houses cannot speak. Uh, and then you have collocation, which are words that typically are always paired up together. You can have table and chairs, um, bed and sheets, couch and cushions, things along those lines. You typically know they're, they go together. You can have one without the other, but it's odd to have one without the other. Hi, my name is Sarah House, and I'm going to be talking about pragmatics. Pragmatics is the study of the invisible meaning of words and phrases. It's basically how we know what the speaker means without it being said or written. It relies on physical context, which is the location, and linguistic context, which is words used with a phrase to infer the meaning. For example, the word bank can be inferred as a financial institution if the word on the outside of a building, which is physical context. However, when someone uses the words deep or steep in the same phrase such as bank, which is the linguistic context, we know they are talking about a type of landmass. The picture I included, it says heavy pedestrian traffic. It could mean two things, that the pedestrians are heavyweight or that there's going to be a lot of pedestrian traffic. We obviously know it means that there's a lot of pedestrian traffic. Hi, I'm Marilise Ramirez and I'll be talking about phonology. Phonology is the study of systems and patterns of speech sounds in languages. In other words, it is the study of ways in which speech sounds form systems. Phonology is... There are 26 letters in the English alphabet, but there are 44 phonemes in English. You might be asking, what is a phoneme? A phoneme is a sound or a group of sounds. They are the basic sounds of language, and they're the building blocks we use when we want to make words, and they are the smallest unit of sound. Each symbol represents one specific sound, just like the chart that's right there. Then we have minimal pairs. Minimal pairs are words that are different by one phoneme. It's when two words are almost the same, but have a different meaning because of one phoneme, just like tape and cape. The beginning phonemes are very different, and that changes the entire context of the word. Then we have allophones. Allophones are variant pronunciations of a particular phoneme. It's something that we hear, and it's a sound that may sound different in its context, just like star and city. In star, we can really hear the T sound, but in city, it's more like a D sound. Even though it's the same, it sounds a little different. 